now, guys, uh, the next uh, material for this exam that I'm going to be talking about is um, the acylomid animals, which uh, we are going to study the, um, the platforms, uh, platy elementes. Uh, this is a little bit of information from beginning of semester. We talked about it. We are coming back and uh, complete it. <clears throat> So this slide and next couple of slides are pretty much uh, everything uh, you need to know, not everything, uh, you need to know it for the rest of semester, what animals are acylomates, what animals are pseudocylomates, what animals are eocylomates. So let's go over that quickly. What happens that, you remember we talked about chelicillus animals and intracellus animals. Now, you remember we talked about the coelom, formation of coelom, and I said, give me a rain check, and I will talk about it uh, later on, and that later on is today. So what happens in schizocellus animals, the cells split right here, and then they form uh, that coelom right here, okay? And then entracellus animals, they have this outpocketing, of formation off of the gut, and eventually these two are the same, right? The end product, if you look at it, the end product are same. So that is for uh, eosilomate, uh, that's for eosilomate animals. Either the coelom is formed, the coelom is either formed by schizocillus or entracillus. Now, those are the animals that have true coelom. Now, what are the animals that they have coelom, but the coelom is uh, filled with cells of mesoderm right here. And those are animals are called acylomate animals. A it means without coelom. Uh, they do have coelom. That's a disagreement I have with the rest of the world, I guess. They do have coelom, but coelom is filled with cells from mesoderm, okay? The pseudocoelomate animals, on the other hand, they have coelom, as you can see it right here, but that space is called pseudocoelom, is surrounded between uh, a layer from endoderm and a layer from mesoderm right here. So that's why they call it pseudocelum. And coelom is a space, a fluid field space. That's what coelom is, pretty much, which is surrounded by definition is a fluid field space, which is surrounded by mesoderm and it's between gut and epidermis. That's the best definition you can get anywhere for uh, coelom. Okay, then the animals are broken down to three groups of acylomate from here on. Of course, I'm not talking about sponges and cnidarians. They didn't have three germ layers. Sponges didn't have any germ layers, but cnidarians and uh, tenophora, uh, they had two germ layers. But these guys that we are talking about, they are triploblastic animals and they have three germ layers. And uh, that's what we are going to talk about next. So um, right here, if you break it down, the flatworms, which we are going to end up talking about in a few minutes, the flatworms, they have the epidermis that came from ectoderm, and they have all of these are mesoderm. It came from mesoderm or uh, mesenchyme, mesoglia layer, if you would, uh, parenchyma. And then you have the endoderm came from God. So three gem layers. But if you look at it, all of that space is filled with cells of mesoderm, the cells that came from mesoderm. The pseudocylomate animals, you have the cells that came from uh, mesoderm, and then you have the cells that came from endoderm, and that space right here is a pseudocylomate uh, space. And then coelomate animals, you see that the coelom is surrounded completely by mesoderm. 
Okay. So study these things, make sure you know the differences between the three. And then if I ask an essay question or multiple choice question, you can answer me. I forgot to turn on the lights here. So you guys can see my other half of my face a little bit. Okay, so anyhow, let's go. And then here again, it tells you what kind of animals have what. They have no mesoderm. These animals, we talked about it, they have no mesoderm. And then these animals that we are going to talk about, they have mesoderm and uh, acylamide animals. And the, these are pseudocylamide animals. I made a proof here. Uh, and then, of course, these are all eosilamate animals. Uh, study these things. Please look at the graphs, look at the charts, and um, make sure you, you know what is going on. Again, the same graph again that I showed it to you. It's coming up again. Um, let me study them. Okay, the acylamate animals introduction, uh, some cephalization, it means head, cephalization means having air, and they're bilateral symmetry animals. They're not radial symmetry animals. The acylamate animals, they are bilateral symmetry. Platy have menthes or flatworms. Uh, platy means flat, as you all know, and helminth, it means warm. Okay, they have true organ. Remember the tissue organ, we talked about it. Uh, before the tissue organ animals, uh, last couple of lectures. And the approached on spiral cleavage, uh, simplest excretory and circuitory system, uh, mesoderm in the form of muscle fibers and mesenchyme, uh, chyme, uh, parenchyma. Uh, three phyla, which we are going to study only one of them, we have slides of one of them, we have specimens from one of them. Yeah, we, we are not going to study Nemartia and uh, Nathosotomyelidia. Uh, we are not going to study those. Uh, Platyhelminthes is the only one we are going to study. So the main characteristics of their triploplastic of Platyhelminthes, their bilateral symmetry, already talked about that. They are flat, dorsal ventrally. Dorsal, it means back, and ventral, it means front. So they are flat dorsal ventrally. They have two muscles, muscle cells, uh, incomplete digestive system. Okay, now you're talking about animals that have three gem layers and incomplete digestive system means they have a mouth and they have an anus. We could not refer that to um, animals like um, hydra or, or or um, uh, jellyfish because they did not have three gem layers. But now, since they have three gem layers, we can use the term complete and incomplete digestive system. We human have complete digestive system. It means our mouth is here and our anus the other end. But these guys, the incomplete digestive system, it means mouth and anus is in the same place. Uh, some have eye spots. Those eye spots cannot form image, but they can detect light intensity. Okay, they cannot form image. Remember that. We still have a long way to go until the animals like octopus or squids, they can form image in their eyes. Later on, it, it's going to come up. Most are monaceous. It means in one organism, you have testes and over. You will see. Okay, just like some um, sponges, uh, you learn that in sponges, uh, hydra is a monaceous animal. Okay. So phylum platy elementis, parenchyma, you remember between the gut and epidermis, that layer is full of cells came from uh, mesoderm, it's called parenchyma. And you saw that term parenchyma before in the liver. Remember that, the layer something to get right back. Most monogenea are ectoparasites. So we'll talk about digenea and monogenea. Mono means one, and genea means one genera, one animal. So genera does not mean, genea does not mean animal, but anyhow, genus. Uh, they are ectoparasites, they're parasites that are outside of uh, their host. We have endoparasite and ectoparasite. I don't know I talked about it in the past or not, but ectoparasites, they cause infestation. Oh, I'm going to 
running our infestation. And the organisms that are inside of our body, they cause infection. So infestation is outside of the uh, organisms and infestation, uh, infestation is outside and infection is inside. So all trematodes and cestodes are endoparasite. And you will see that. What they are, they are name of classes of uh, platyhelminthes, phylum class. And then indirect and direct life cycle, we studied that before, you know what that means. Direct life cycle is the transmission from fecal matter or from other things uh, straight to another host. That's a direct uh, life cycle. In that life cycle, it has to go through mosquito. It has to go through snail. If it doesn't, life cycle is not going to get completed. Okay, so just like you learned in the past, malaria, the ha mosquito has to be present. If the mosquito is not present, we human cannot get malaria. How about that? Uh, giardia, there is no mosquito needed. It just fecal matter picked up by water or food or something, and you become infected with giardia, and that's it. So that's direct life cycle. Giardia is direct, malaria is indirect. Imeria is direct from chicken to chicken, from you know what I'm talking about. Final host is vertebrate animal. Final host, it means the host that the sexual reproduction takes place or definitive host. Another name for final host is then a definitive host. It is usually the vertebrate animals like us in most cases. And the triploblastic uh, cnidarians were not. And then body fluid moves by muscular contraction. So when the animal moves like this, so the body uh, fluid, they do not have a circulatory system, but the fluid inside of the body moves. Uh, class Turbularia, so first class of this phylum, phylum uh, Platea menthes, the first class, we're going to talk about that. Um, Turbularia, uh, the organism that we have in the lab when school was in session, I, I gave you some planaria, and your group used to have six, seven, eight, ten planaria, and you do experiments with them. And then you tell the class the result of your experiment. They're small, very small worm. Uh, they're flat, and then uh, they were wiggling in the dish, and you had to do something with them. So uh, the, uh, the scientific name is uh, Dugesia uh, tri a tie, uh, like a tiger, uh, tigrinia. Uh, so Dugesia tigrinia, different textbook, the name of the species, write it down different. I guess there are subspecies, but anyhow. Um, Yes, definitely, you should know. Planaria is a common name, and the GCR uh, tigrinia is the name of the scientific name. And then they're free living. Planaria is free living. It does not need to go inside of the host, and they're mostly marine. Uh, the class Turbularia are uh, marine, but Planaria is fresh water. It's not a marine animal, okay? Free living and marine. marine. Uh, planarians, epidermis ciliated on the ventral side, and then mouth on ventral side, no anus, of course, we talked about that. Simple life cycle, they don't have to go through any other host or any other thing. Uh, gastrodermis has phagocytes, they have phagocytes, as you know, their cells that can engulf uh, the food uh, by a pseudopod. So class temporaria continue pla planaria ex uh, excrete water out of the wine because planaria is a fr in fresh water and the water keeps going from outside into the animal, okay? So the animal has to come up with a system to get rid of that excess water. We studied in Protista, they had the vesicles, remember that? And they had ampulla. These guys is a little bit different. They're more advanced than protista. So the, what happens, the water, they had developed a system called uh, the flame cells, the excretory system. And they have flame cells, which are for osmoregulations. These flame cells, they have cilia or flagella, and they beat and they collect the water and then through the pores throughout the body and they excrete them out. I'll show you some. 
three types of neuron, sensory motor and association neuron. We talked about those uh, in the past. So they have all of them. And I'm not gonna go over it again. I talked about it. Uh, please make sure you know what sensory neuron is. It takes the information from, of course, these animals do not have brain. They have cerebral ganglion, but they take the information to cerebral ganglion and from cerebral ganglion, probably to another neuron which is called association neuron. And from that neuron goes to motor neuron, which is attached to muscle cells, if you have muscle cells. A cili or light sensitive eye spots, that's what uh, it is. And I'll show you asexual regeneration, uh, stem cells, sorry about that. Sorry. So asexual regeneration, what happens, if you cut these animals, they will grow back. If you cut it in half, uh, if the animal is like this, then you cut it in half, this half will grow, and that half will grow. Longitudinally, you cut them. Uh, there were some success, not some, so, so much some success, in the experiments that you guys have done in the lab in the past. I'm saying people in your calendar. But uh, stem cell in the middle of the animals, uh, so the name of the stem cell, did I give it to you? Uh, turbularians are monaceous but practice cross fertilizations. Uh, it, it will come up. Okay, I, um, it, it will come up. Turbularians, they are monaceous. It means one um, uh, planaria or turbularian, the name of the class, it has both male and female reproductive tract, but they can, they do, but most of the time, two of them come together and transfer sperm and egg. Fertilization means female ovidum. Ah, here we go, neoplasts. Neoplasts are the name of the stem cells. So the animal grows, usually if you cut the animal in the middle, uh, they have a lot of neoplasts in the middle of the animal. So the animal, the, the bottom portion will grow the head region and the head region will grow the bottom region. So for regeneration, they are carnivorous animals. They like to eat meat when we bring them to the lab, we gave them chicken, liver is their favorite, beef, whatever um, students had brought from home and they gave, they gave them. Metabolic waste by diffusion through the body wall, rhabdite cells, and they are, uh, they release, rhabdite cells release some kind of adhesive material so they can, um, gooey material, I should say, gooey, not adhesive gooey material so they can uh, glide on that, uh, just like snails. Uh, I don't know if you've seen snails tracks or not. Uh, so it's a material that they release and so they can glide on. Three types of muscles on the microscope, make sure you can identify them as longitudinal, circular, and radial muscle. Longitudinal muscle runs in the length of the animal, circular runs like this, and um, the radial animals, it goes from this end to that end. And you will see some pictures here in a minute, I hope. If not in the lab, I'll talk about it. Parenchyma cells, they are the cells that are uh, in the middle of the animal between gut and epidermis. It's a layer that is referred to as a parenchyma layer or parenchyma cells, uh, which are pretty much in the middle of the animal. Uh, Protonephridia, they are same as flame cells. Some textbooks say protonephridia or flame wall of flame cells. Here is the digestive tract if you do, um, uh, here is the uh, mouth right here. So this is pharynx, it's like a vacuum. It sucks food when they go sit on a piece of a liver or a meat. And when they suck food, then the food goes into the gastrovascular cavity right here. Those branches of the gastrovascular cavity is called diverticulum. And undigested material get out through the same place. Okay. The, circuit, the nervous system, the nervous system is like a ladder. Look at this, this is a ladder, okay? And that's what uh, most textbooks say. But they have accumulation of many neuron up here. We do not call it brain. We call it neural ganglion, new, new, neural ganglion. 
And then they, these are called uh, nerve cord, two nerve cords. And then these are called transverse nerves. They connect the two nerve cords together. And the nerves out here on the periphery of the animal is called uh, lateral nerve. Okay, it will come up if it is not in here. Transverse nerves, lateral nerve, it will come up. And then the reproductive tract near the testes, you can see that right here, they make sperm. And then you have the ovary up here only, and then you have the oviduct. And then there are some yolk glands, which they didn't mention it in here. Yeah, there are some yolk glands right here, which makes the yolk around the egg. So, and these are the excretory system, which is the flame cell. Uh, I have better pictures. It will come up and uh, later on, if there's a redundant, redundant type of information, I will not go over it and we'll just move on. Here it is again. Uh, so um, this uh, pharynx right here, let's talk about digestive system, pharynx right here. Uh, they said mouth, that's not the right mouth, it's right here. So uh, the pharynx, uh, it can protrude outside and come back inside of the animal. It's just like that. That's how the pharynx it can go outside of the animal, as you can see, and it can uh, retract, protrude and retract. And then you have intestine, uh, lateral nerve. Finally, they are mentioning it here, cerebral ganglion, lateral nerve. And then uh, you have diverticulum, which are the branches of the gastrovascular cavity. Pharynx, we talked about that, pharyngeal chamber or uh, mouth right here. I don't. God knows whether he's pointing or not. Transverse nerves, I already talked about that. Ovary, oviduct, testes, and vas deferens, do not worry about that. Seminal receptacles, do not worry about that. Vagina, do not worry about these. Genital core, penis, do not worry about that. Seminal receptacles, do not worry about that. Osmoregulatory tubes, that pretty much same as uh, excretory tube, same thing. And then uh, flame cells, which are at the end here of them cells, right here, right there, right there, right there, those are flame cells. And they're explaining the flame cells here that you can see the um, flame cells are here and these are flagella, oh, come on, go back. These are uh, flagella or cilia and they push the waste material into the canals, right? These uh, excretory canals and from there it goes either out throughout the animal. Come on, come on. Oh, my hand hurts. But it goes throughout the animal, the waste material, or oh, that will go out through the uh, mouth. Okay, here's a cross section of the animal. We do have slide of this, and these are the parts I would like you to know. This is the real animal, the stain that this is the real animal. They stain it, and we, in the lab we have one through the eye, one cut through the eye, one through the uh, intestine, uh, one through pharynx, and one through the posterior end of the animal. And so let's go over the parts. Uh, parenchyma, yes, whatever you have to know uh, on your slides, uh, I'm circling them because we do have them in the lab. Parenchyma layer, I already mentioned that. So in the lab practical exam, I have to ask you, what is the name of the layer? Because you don't know I'm referring to the radial muscle, I'm referring to uh, gut, well, I have no idea, but all of that is called parenchyma layer. Uh, dual gland, adhesive glands, I talked about this a little bit before, but do not worry about it. Rhabdoid cells, they will secrete mucus, you cannot see it. Um, I said circulate, so not worry about that one. Rhabdoid cells, uh, gland cells, you cannot see that. Epidermis, of course, you can see that nice and beautifully. Circular muscles, absolutely, you can see those circular muscles on the epidermis, they run in a circle, okay? Of course, you have pharynx and then uh, pharyngeal cavity uh, or uh, oral cavity, they call it. Uh, columnar epithelial tissue, you can see those nicely. That's a uh, gastrodermis. I might refer to it as gastrodermis. And then these are parenchymal muscle. Remember, we talked about that, or radial muscle. 
Another name for that muscle comes from uh, dorsal end of the animal to ventral end of the animal, and it's called parenchymal muscle or radial muscle. Then you have longitudinal muscles underneath of circulatory muscles. You have these, this is another parenchymal muscles, parenchymal muscles. Okay, you guys can see it. And then um, longitudinal muscles, cilia. Ooh, that's tough. Uh, anyhow, you can see those. Nerve cord, yes, you can see it on a good slide. And pharyngeal muscles, yes, you can see that. Intestine, absolutely, you can see that under microscope. Okay. Class Termatoda. So we are done with terrible area. I don't know how long I have been talking about, but uh, let's talk about trematodes. Um, these are very interesting animals. Um, let's talk about them. Um, all parasitic flukes, they are flukes. I, I don't know if you've heard of the term flukes or not. Uh, they have tegument. Their tegument has no cilia, unlike their planaria, their cousins, terbolaria, and their uh, Skin, the epithelial cells in there is syncytial. What does that mean? It means they have a layer on top and then the layer on the bottom, the cell membrane it goes like that and it goes like that and it goes like that, it goes like that. And then there's a nucleus right here in all of these. And what happens, the cytoplasm is percolating in all of these. That's why they call it uh, it's syncytial. Remember the term syncytial? I gave it to you before. Syncytial means you have one cell and it has several nuclei inside of a cell. That's uncommon in animal kingdom. Okay, usually most cells have one cell, one nucleus, most of the time. When you study it in your skeletal, system, uh, skeletal muscle, that's not the case. Okay, so but, but in here, the cell membrane this is a cell membrane and I'm drawing it again. It's like that. And then these are the nuclei, okay? That's how one cell, if you would, one cell look like, okay? And of course, outside there is no cilia. They do not have cilia. And then this outside is called tegument. Oh, they have two suckers, oral sucker and ventral sucker which I will talk, we will see that. Subclass diagenia, yes, you should know that. Uh, we have diagenia and monogenia in underclass ter, uh, trematoda, class trematoda, two subclasses, diagenia and monogenia. Intermediate host, um, they do have intermediate host, a sexual reproduction takes place there, and they have a final host where the sexual reproduction takes place there. Here's a life cycle of it. I don't expect you to know what leads to what, what becomes what, what becomes what, uh, in a multiple choice or anything like that. But you guys should know that, um, you know, why, I guess I propose the question, why this type of life cycle? Um, because uh, the way the animal evolved, these animals evolved, they have to go through several hosts. Right here, snail, sometimes they go through uh, meat of fish, and then eventually they end up in human. Let's say, let's talk about the ones that are in human. So they have to go through at least three hosts until the life cycle is complete. And that is why one egg, you start the life cycle, one egg can become many, many, many larvae. And you will see that. So what happens? Uh, when in the feces of human egg, uh, egg is released from human feces, for example, and then the americidium still one, uh, it will come out, it's ciliated, and it goes find the snail. In the snail, it multiplies asexually, and it becomes sporocyst. Inside of the sporocyst, you have radia. Inside of radia, you have cercaria. And finally, the cercaria gets out of uh, the snail. That's in most cases. And then the metacercaria, a couple of things happens. Either they have to go find a fish or they go sit on a vegetation until human or cow or sheep comes and eat them. 
Then in the feces of the cow, sheep, the eggs are released and the cycle must go on again. Remember, if the snail is not there, the proper snail, the life cycle does not go on. If vegetation is not there, the life cycle does not go on. If in some cases, human, the fish is not there, the life cycle will stop. That's why one egg, you will not see it anywhere else in animal kingdom. Nowhere else, just right here. One egg becomes many larvae. And then of course, the odds of those larvae infect a fish or human or cow or sheep, what have you, increases, the chances increase. The rest of animal kingdom, one egg, one organism one larva or one adult, whatever you want to call it. Not even yet. You know, arthropods are very successful on planet Earth. They are doing great. They are, <laughs> and we'll talk about them later on. They are the owner of the Earth, not us. We think we are the owner. But arthropods, they lay a lot of eggs, but one egg becomes one ant. Not in this case. In this case, one egg can become several worms. Okay, so, and of course, one egg becomes many larvae, and those larvae, each one of them has the chance of uh, becoming uh, an adult organism. Let's move on. So, Singular can rise to many projects. Here is, the, I was talking about syncytial epidermis right here. You guys can see that. I was talking about that. Okay. So they have uh, the uh, tegument has the spine and uh, distal cytoplasm and so on and so forth. Read it for your own um, uh, interest. And of course, uh, make sure you know. Tegument of and the parasites are resistant to host immune system, of course, uh, and digestive juices. So this is resistant to um, antibodies and enzymes. And uh, pathology, necrosis of liver, they can cause, are we talking about uh, fasciola hepatica? Yeah, I guess I'm talking about fasciola hepatica. Uh, necrosis of liver, inflammation, edema, um, atrophy of parenchyma, cirrhosis, and joints. All of those are uh, relative diseases of um, liver. Ah, <laughs> fasciola hepatica. In animals uh, like sheep and cow, ruminant animals, um, uh, they call it liver, liver rot, liver rot. Okay, here it is. We human can get it by eating uh, raw vegetation. Um, the cow and sheep get it by eating vegetation. Uh, cow and sheep release the egg. The egg becomes mercedium. Mercedium, uh, go find the snail. Out of the snail is Garcer carrier. This, of course, inside of the snail, he's mentioning it. Inside of the snail, you have sporocyst. We talked about that sporocyst. Then you have radia. Inside of radia, there are spor uh, cercaria. Cercaria get out of snail and go find some vegetation. Sits on vegetation and sheep or cow eat them. The life cycle goes on. If the human eat the vegetation, then we can end up with having uh, some um, hepatic binary duct, we can have some liver problems as well. The next organism is a uh, Fasciolopsis buski. It, it is called human uh, small intestinal uh, fluke or human intestinal fluke, another name for it. Getting it by eating aquatic vegetation, uh, pathology, inflammation, malabsorption of new nutrients diarrhea and even death in heavy infections. Right here is a uh, life cycle of uh, uh, Buski, which uh, pigs also can become infected with it. As a result, we release, or pigs release the feces that has the eggs in them. The eggs uh, becomes mercedium. Out of the egg comes that ciliated organisms. Mercedium find the snail. Of course, in the snail, you have sporosis, 3 d cercaria. The cercaria comes out, goes to vegetation. We human eat those vegetation, and voila, you become infected with uh, 
the intestinal um, uh, fluke, which is uh, uh, Fasciolopsis buski. Here they are, this gentleman is uh, collecting some uh, vegetations from this lake. And if this somebody else came in here on the banks of the lake pooped, and of course the right snail is in the water, aquatic snail. So the poop from there, the mercidium gets out of the egg, goes inside of the snail, becomes uh, sporocyst, tridia, cercaria, cercaria comes out and goes on these vegetations, this human eat these vegetations right here, and voila, whenever they have to go poop next time, they go on the banks and poop there. So the life cycle goes on and on, just from human. But this is not a direct life cycle. Remember that this is an indirect life cycle because you do need the snail in here, right? And then of course, by drinking the water, the person does not become infected by eating the vegetations. So this, out of the snail comes uh, metacycaria and they fly and they go, uh, not they fly, they swim and they go sit on the vegetations until they become mature and then we human eat them. The next organism still class, uh, subclass Diogenea and it is human liver fluke, which is uh, Clinorchis sinensis. Uh, I like these terminologies. You can impress somebody on a dinner table. Clinorchis sinensis, Asilapsis pusci. <laughs> but anyhow, so what happens? We human, let's start with human feces. Human feces have the eggs. The eggs have an operculum right here. Out of the operculum comes the uh, mericidium. Remember that mericidium goes find the snail. Inside of the snail, you have sporocysts. We already talked about that. Inside of sporocysts, you have radio. Inside of radio, you have cercaria. Cercaria get out of the snail and go find a fish. So you need two, three hosts for uh, human liver fruit. Clonarchus sinensis, three. Okay, snail, fish, and human. And the, you know, the cercaria penetrates into fish and form a metacercaria in the meat. You know, this is common still in um, far Eastern countries, like uh, not in Japan so much, but in Korea and uh, China, remote area of China, Vietnam, Cambodia. It is still there in the remote area, not in metropolitan area, not in the cities. So, uh, because people, uh, they defecate near water and there's aquatic snail near that water. And then they grab fish. They can fish from the same body of water, the pond, river, lake, what have you. And then uh, they usually, uh, uh, they pickle fish. They do not, sometimes they fry them, they cook them, which will kill the metacycaria. But when you pickle the fish, the pickling does not kill them at the sick area. So they eat pickle fish and of course they become infected. They go next to the bank of the river, lake, pond, and they defecate. And then of course, they, you know, this uh, mercidium find the snail and they are the proper snails there. So uh, the life cycle goes on. Okay, give two, uh, give two reasons why tegument is beneficial to platyamentes. As I talked about it, the antibodies and the enzyme of the host cannot kill. Here is it, uh, parts of the animal. Um, we do have this in the lab, uh, metacycaria meat, oral suckers and ventral suckers, human liver fluid. So here's an oral sucker, here's a ventral sucker. Here is, is parenchymal muscles, uh, pharyngeal muscles, sorry. It, excretory tube, you will not see it on slides, but you will see pharyngeal muscles. Intestine or cecum, you can see it right here. It runs all the way down. Of course, these have uh, uh, incomplete digestive system. You know that. And then you have uterus, ventral sucker. Of course, I mentioned that. Uterus, you can see all of those. Vitellaria, it's a yolk gland. Vitellaria for the rest of semester. Vitellarium, vitellaria. Plural, but singular, it means yolk clan. 
Then you have ovary, seminal receptacles, in which they receive sperm, anterior testes, bladder. This is excretory bladder right here. And this is excretory pore right here. And the model in the lab you have, you can see that the excretory bladder. But the slides, the microscopic slides, you cannot see that. Okay, then you have testes again. Uh, you can see that sperm duct, do not worry about it. Laura's gland, there's not a parasitology course, but um, they, add, uh, they add a shell uh, around the egg, so do not worry about that. Let's align duct, look duct, okay? Uh, I don't think you can see that. Vast deference, do not worry about it. Seminal vesicle, um, again, do not worry about it. Gonopore, I doubt it you can see that. And then excretory tube, I doubt it you can see. Okay, so pretty much I mentioned what you have to see, oral soccer course. Okay, uh, the next organism is Schistosoma species. There are three species of Schistosoma, which I will talk about them. They are called, they call them blood fluke. Common name is blood fluke. And uh, the old name is Bilaharzia is the name of the person, a lot of people were looking to discover the life cycle of it, uh, but finally, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Harzia uh, discovered it. Uh, male is bigger than female, and the male has gynecophory canal. Male has gynecophory canal, okay? The three species of uh, schistosoma, I already spelled it, schistosoma on top, so I'm just saying S, and Sony um, in veins of large intestine is found in Africa, Brazil, West Indies, and many northern part of South America. So Schistosoma and Sony is found in Africa, uh, uh, West Indies, and uh, you should know South America. Then Schistosoma Japanicum is found in Far Eastern countries. And Japan is remote part of Japan quickly. You can't find it in any more part of Japan, but uh, far eastern countries, she's so much Japan. And it's found in the veins of the small intestine. And she's so much hematobium, is found in the vein of urinary bladder, northern Africa, usually, uh, Middle East, portion of Middle East. And there are no metacircaria or radio stage in this organism. This organism, she's so much, does not have, we're still talking about uh, trematoda. Class, subclass digenium. So uh, schistosoma hematobium story about that goes in old, 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 old northern African countries. So what happened, I'm not going to mention the name of any country in northern Africa. So, you know, the females have their period. You see the blood, they say, okay, she's uh, mature now, she can have a family. In men, when they saw uh, blood in their urine, they said, okay, he's mature enough, we should give him a wife and we should give him a, uh, you know, a herd of sheep and then have him uh, form his family. While they didn't know that schistosoma uh, hematobium causes urinary uh, you know, blood, yeah, there's a term for that and I'm drawing blank now. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so there is, uh, there is blood in Europe. The other two, Schistosoma mansoni and Schistosoma japanicum, you can see the, uh, the blood in the feces, okay? So these animals, uh, Schistosoma adult itself, usually does cause no harm. It's just the egg of these organisms that they puncture, they call ulceration of our blood. Here we go. We call ulceration of our blood vessels. Blood vessels where? Blood vessels in small intestine, large intestine, and urinary bladder. And that's why you see blood in the feces, or blood in the urine. I hope I'm making some sense. And the eggs of these organisms cause those devastations. And in the United States, of course, we do not have any of those, uh, luckily. Uh, but in the United States, we have swimmer's itch. And what is swimmer's itch? It's called, I do not underline this. It's not a scientific name. It's called schistosoma uh, dermatitis. 
what happens the birds that have their own schistosoma. So when they fly over a pond, river, in resorts, you have ponds and the birds fly and they drop uh, the feces on the ponds. And then what happens, uh, these proper snail for the species of the schistosoma of the bird, and then when and the officer carrier is looking for another uh, bird to get into, what happens, we human go swimming in, the, in those ponds and then the cercaria penetrate our skin, okay? So when the cercaria penetrate our skin, our immune system kills them. They cannot become adult. So when our immune system kills them, they call it swimmer's itch. You see little dots, there are some pictures of it online, I've seen it. Uh, the little dots are even if the itch is too much, you can put one person hydrocortisone, you can get off of the shelf. And one person hydrocortisone on your skin, and the itch will be gone. They're going to be gone next day. Okay, has nothing, no effect on you because we are the wrong host for them. So the cercaria penetrate. Let's look at the life cycle. Uh, what method of biological control? So um, I hope. Uh, this is the life cycle of, uh, yeah. okay, so this is, this is the human, the cercaria, look at the cercaria is branched. Uh, you saw the cercaria in schistosoma, uh, I'm sorry, in fasciola hepatica and fasciolopsis guski, it was like this, right? But these guys, the schistosoma is branched, uh, cercaria is branched. And then what you can see, you, you know, the cercaria penetrates into the snail and out of snail comes a uh, sporocyst and uh, out of the sporocyst comes the cercaria. So they do not have a radium stage anymore. Okay, so, um, and then another, the difference between this and the rest of the uh, diagenia, the cercaria, penetrates human skin. You didn't have that before. You had to get it by vegetation or eating fish. These guys penetrate skin and then voila, inside of skin, these cercaria, some of them become male, some of them become female. There they are, male, <laughs> female, okay? Male and female, in our gut copulate. So schistosoma are not monaceous, they are dioecious. That means sexes are separate, like human. The human sexes are separate, male, female. So they are dioecious, male and female copulate, and they release the eggs, and these are the eggs that cause damage cause our uh, blood vessels to bleed. Okay. Blood vessels are wherever it is. For Japanicum, they are specific sites. Japanicum, small intestine, uh, hematopium, urinary bladder, and Mansoni, large intestine. Here it is, the life cycle again. So uh, the human feces or Urine, it goes in the body of water, they find the snail, right? Out of the snail, of course, in the snail, you have radio. Out of the snail, uh, it comes out uh, to uh, uh, cercaria. Cercaria goes and penetrate into human skin. So what that means, this gentleman has to defecate in water and he has to go bare hand or bare feet, either one, into that water. Uh, schistosoma dermatitis, we go into the water and they say, carry up, penetrate our skin, but you're not the proper host for them. So they die in 24 hours under our skin. Okay. Here is surface liver of the schistosomal uh, hepatica fibrosis. So schistosomal and hepatica, um, hepatic uh, shows schistosomal um, it does affect our liver. Uh, 
It's not just, we don't have schistosomal hepatica. Uh, fasciola hepatica we have. Uh, of a, uh, it does affect our liver. Let me show you some pictures here. Okay, so this is uh, schistosomal. This, it, it caused dwarfism. Another effect of schistosomal is caused dwarfism. And this is a 13 year old boy. This is a 24 year old man. Look at them. He, he caused in that gentleman, he's 24 years old, caused uh, dwarfism. And of course, it caused enlargement of liver. This is huge liver also caused by schistosome. Okay, so that is um, another effect of schistosome. Uh, World Health Organization, right here, WHO, you're familiar with that one, uh, says that there are six major diseases in the world. Out of those six major diseases, five of them are parasites, guys. Think about it. HIV is not there. Tuberculosis is not there. Corona is not there. Influenza is not there. We lose many, many, many million people each year due to those six diseases. Schistosomiasis, which is, we studied that already. We talked about it. People lose their lives because of schistosomiasis. Malaria, the numbers are high. Uh, Fluoriasis, you have not studied that. We will study in uh, third exam. Uh, this is the fourth exam. Trypanosomiasis. Sleeping sickness, many million people die each year because of that. And Leishmaniasis. This is the information from World Health Organization. And of course, leprosy uh, is up there too, uh, caused by bacteria. Uh, that's the only one that is caused by bacteria. The other, the, other, the only thing we didn't study yet is fluoriasis, which we'll talk about. There are all of them you studied already. Something for you to become a doctor later on in your life, think about it. Okay, so the focus needs to be given to parasites a little bit more than. Uh, I'm not saying they are not important. I'm not saying tuberculosis is not important. Uh, maybe controlling them, tuberculosis and I don't know, corona influenza, controlling them is easier. That's why a lot of money is going into it, but I know Bill Gates is putting a lot of money into malaria um, for vaccine control, whatever it is there. Okay, this is a picture of uh, Paragonimus westermanii. Um, again, we do not have slide of this in the lab, do not worry about it, uh, but uh, Paragonimus westermanii is, uh, they call it long fluke, uh, yeah, long flukes, and then um, uh, crab is intermediate host. We human get it by eating crab. So there are two ways. Again, something unique. I bring up these parasites because uh, each one of them have something unique. Uh, it's not that devastating, that devastating but uh, what happens uh, since they are in the lungs, the adult worms live in the lungs. lungs. And what would happen so when we cough up the egg into our mouth, and some people are polite, they swallow, and it goes from our respiratory tract, the eggs goes to digestive tract, and then we poop by body of water, and then goes to the body of water. Or some people just, they threw up their sputum in a body of water. When it goes into the body of water, of course, the mercidium will come out, and then find a snail, and the, from the mycelium, uh, cicada go find into the crayfish. We eat the crayfish. And then, of course, a raw, and we become infected with uh, uh, pergama, Pergonomus westermai. So, two ways this parasite can leave their host one by sputum and one by fecal matter. And I told you how from sputum some people swallow it, it goes into the feces. That's how it is. Here they are, these guys are uh, collecting crayfish. 
And then, uh, so if they eat it raw, it is possible that they get wrong food to eat it. Uh, here are the kids playing and uh, catching crayfish. And then, of course, if they eat it, it is possible. Uh, subclass monogenea. Um, you remember we, we are talking about subclass uh, digenia. This is subclass monogenea. We human do not get it. We human do not get infected with monogenea. They're all parasitic on gills and external surface of fish. And then ectoparasitism, it causes infestation and direct life cycle, single host. Egg becomes single larva, oncomericidium, adult. And then I gave you one organism of this adapter. It's that posterior end of the animal, they have this uh, apparatus that clings on to the gills of fish and suck blood. And then when they suck blood, they become mature, they become adult, they let it go. And the life cycle, they, you know, they release egg and the larva swings and becomes oncomericidium and oncomericidium attached to the gills of fish and suck blood. They release, they become adult. One organism I gave you from this subclass is Gyrodactylus cylindriformis. Gyrodactylus cylindriformis. So I would like you to, uh, if I have a picture of uh, tapeworms, I do not have. There is a picture of uh, monogenia in your textbook with a pistothacter. Okay. Uh, it's a structure toward the posterior end of the animals. Very complex, you know, it, it clings on, allows the animal clings on to the um, gills of fishes. Uh, class Cestoda, I don't want to talk too much, but let's talk, let's finish it up um, quickly. Um, tapeworms, all members of this class are parasitic. Uh, three major parts scolex, neck, and strobula. Uh, scolex is the uh, upper portion of the animal, anterior portion of the animal, which has suckers and hooks. Uh, not all of them have uh, hooks. Most of them have suckers. The neck region is asexual reproduction happens. These animals uh, become elongated through the neck region. And the strobula is the proglottis toward the end of the animal. No digestive enzymes. Uh, so how do you think uh, they obtain their food? Uh, they obtain no digestive system. They obtain their food through their tegument. So the food that we eat is absorbed through their body wall into their uh, inside of the body. Nearly all monaceous, so they're not unlike schistosoma. They're uh, monaceous. And tapeworms, gross anatomy, scolex, or whole fast may contain prostellum. Prostellum is the elevation of the head. It's called prostellum. Germinative zone or neck zone is called germinative zone. Adult invertebrates, intermediate hosts are in invertebrates. Cross fertilization, since they are monaceous, cross fertilization occurs, and usually they do not harm their hosts. That's an advantage. They have not re received commensalism yet with their hosts but usually they do not harm their host. And I will not talk about the parasites that will take worms that they do not harm their host. There are lots of them there, uh, but uh, I will talk about the ones that they do harm their host. Oh, right here. Okay, so right here, this is our gut, our intestine, the villus and their epithelial cells are here. They attach their scolex. Uh, this is scolex. It has hooks on top and suckers on the side. They attach to our intestine, and this is the whole entire worm. It's a long, that's what they call a tapeworm. It's a long worm. So the neck area, this is the germinative zone, which you add segment by segment by segment by segment. This is a segment, if you would, right here. So this would be the mature proglottids right here. The mature proglottid, it has testes, ovaries, uh, the uterus, okay, your glands, genital pore, some of the things you can see on the microscope. So this area of the animal right here, that's pretty much mature proglottids. Then the ripe proglottids are toward the very end of the animal. These proglottids right here, each segment is called proglottids. Okay. 
this is uterus full of eggs. Two possibilities. Some species, this proglottid separates from the animal and get out in the feces. Some species, they don't. They just release the egg. So two possibilities. I'll start with. Tinea saginata, it's a, uh, it's a uh, beef uh, tapeworm, cystocytes uh, in beef. It does not harm us human. It really is one of those parasites that I'm mentioning in here that they do not harm human. We human get uh, tapeworms, different type of tapeworms, and they do not harm us. But we get the ones that harm us, I will talk about that. So if we eat the cystocentis, which is the larval stage in beef, we become infected with it. And then if the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture inspectors, even though it caused not much harm in human, they see in the, them in the beef, they're like yellow white nodules in the in beef, uh, they condemn the animal. The animal cannot go to the market. It cannot be sold. Scolex has four suckers, but no hooks. Okay, make sure you know these things. Excretory ducts has flame cells, life cycle in cattle, eggs become oncosphere, oncosphere becomes bladder worms or cystocerci, cystocerci is a plural, cystocercus is singular, and cystocerci becomes adult and shed the egg in human. Right here is a life cycle. <clears throat> Let's say we eat beef. Uh, that is not cooked well, and then uh, it has cyst circus in it. The cyst circuit here is a measly beef, they call it. Measly beef, these light white nodules in the beef can be seen. Uh, the USD con uh, inspectors condom them and cannot go to the food chain. Anyhow, and then we eat that inside of our body, that cyst circus, that one cyst circus can become one table. Usually we, uh, tapeworms, they do not populate themselves inside of their host gut. One tapeworm. And they do, as you know, they multiply just by, um, from the, the macroregion germinators. And then uh, they release these uh, proglottids in the feces and the eggs look like that. The cow comes and eat, the human have to poop in the pastures, in the grass. And then they come and eat that grass. And then inside of them, you have those sister circles. That's it. That's a life cycle of beef, uh, measly beef. Or, uh. The next one is tinea solium. Tinea solium, uh, not good. <laughs> uh, adult in human and juvenile in pork. Uh, so, but if juvenile, is found in human usually end up in the brain. And that's a problem. So we human end up eating the eggs of this parasite, not eating the juvenile that from pork, we, we end up eating the eggs, the eggs become juvenile, become cystocercus in human, and that is a problem, okay? Cystocerci in human are possible. Cerebral cystocercosis, I'll show you some pictures. And Rostellum scolex has both suckers and hooks. Okay, so they have both hooks and suckers. The beef one did not have hooks. Okay, they have suckers. If eggs or proglottis are ingested, the embryo migrates to organs and form cystocerci in a human. Cystocercosis occurs in the eyes, in the brain, and results in blindness, uh, serious neurological symptoms, and of course, death. Here is a, uh, they, they, by mistake, they wrote down both of them. Usually, they put both of them here. Yes, tinea saginata and tinea solium. Okay, so this is tinea solium, T solium, and then this is T saginata. They put them together and they are comparing the differences between the two. But they have hooks, sodium has hooks, saginata does not have hooks, they have suckers. Okay, 
So, and they release these in the egg, uh, in the feces, they proglottid separates in the feces. And of course, um, the tineosolium has seven, they call it seven branches of uh, uterus, but uh, saginata has more than seven. Some of the differences, uh, it would be good for you to know between the two, okay? Here is the a microscopic picture of it, the ovary uterus. These are all, you can see it in the slide, the microscope on the excretory canal. Oh, I don't think it works. Sorry. You cannot see that. Uh, sperm duct, you cannot see that. Genital floor, absolutely. Vagina, do not worry about it. You can see it. Melis gland. Uh, if you were taking a parasitology course, yes, all of these I would ask you to know. Uh, of course, we have a different variety of slides. Vitaline glands, yes, you can see that. Okay, so each one of this is a proglottis. What kind of proglottis is this? This is a mature proglottis, not ripe. Ripe or uh, gra a gra a gravid proglottis, it's a uterus full of eggs. This is cerebral cystocercosis. Of course, these are all cystocercosis from tinea solium. Of course, tinea solium. And of course, this person, as you can see, they died. Um, surgery, what you're gonna do? How many you're gonna do? It's, it's hard, very hard. I feel like there's more, but again, you guys dig it out. The differences between tinea saginata and tinea solium. Tinea solium. Uh, Diphenobotrum latum, uh, the scolex, uh, this parasite, the scolex is kind of unique. And, uh, uh, this parasite will compete with your vitamin B12, okay? And then it causes, because of lack of vitamin B12 in our diet, it causes pernicious anemia or megaloblastic anemia. It means the red blood cells are huge. This is the normal red blood cells, the megaloblastic, they become huge. And of course, they do not have the right coloration. They cannot carry blood, uh, carry oxygen in our body, so we develop anemia, a different type of anemia we have. One of the anemia we have is B12 deficiency, which leads into pernicious anemia or megaloblastic anemia. Uh, we eat, get it by eating fish, raw fish again. We human defecate in the water, uh, the mercidium comes out, it goes through crayfish and eat the crayfish. Again, I'm not worried about all of those details, but you should know we get uh, diphenobarthrum latum by eating uh, raw fish. And it happens in the United States on Great Lakes. It can happen in the United States. Uh, what else we talked about? Uh, these are all the tinea saginata, tinea solium. It can happen in the United States, okay? All over the world, cosmopolitan. Okay, uh, here's the scolex. You have these longitudinal suckers, they call them. Some people say, no, they really do not have suckers. We don't know what they have. Anyhow, uh, that's unique uh, to the world of tapeworms. The next one is echinococcus granulosis. It's normal in sheep, uh, uh, between the sheep and um, dogs the uh, carnivore animals, but when we human get it, Houston, we got problem. Okay, so you kind of got this grand uh, The name of the cyst is called unilocular hydatid cyst and found in dogs and other canine. A human as an intermediate host, cystic circus is called hydatid cyst and list for more distance adaptation techniques that cystos develops to be successful. Why cystos are so successful? And I'm uh, mentioning the ones that are uh, really harmful to human, uh, but one of them already said they do not usually harm their host, like echinococcus granulosis. It does not harm dogs. It does not harm sheep, okay? But we human, we go on. It's a very small tapeworm. It's made up of three or four segments. One, two, three, four. That's it. Okay, so uh, it it, it can attach uh, to the liver or the abdominal portion of our body. And the cyst, the hydatid cyst can become as big as a bat signal. Okay. Right here, 
So this is a sylvatic cycle between dog and sheep. It goes uh, in a while, has no, nothing, no problem. But if the human ingests the eggs from dog feces, we pet the dog. Um, those who, a uh, little boy went to Italy, uh, spent some time with relatives in Italy, and then came back with a big basketball. Well, after a few months, he had a huge hydatidosis because he was petting the dogs and the egg, he ingested the egg accidentally, okay? And then the egg became uh, huge. Uh, so anyhow, and the only way of getting it out, here is a lady who has a huge hydatid cyst. And the only way to get out, get it out by surgery right here. Uh, let's hope the surgeon's skill, if these burst open, what can happen? they have the toxic uh, fluid in there, it can uh, cause uh, uh, toxic shock syndrome in the patient. The patient can die right away on the table. So uh, the surgeon must be skilled and very careful uh, when you get taken and out to be paid. Uh, and here they are, another one in the brain can be found. The palladium caninum in dogs uh, and cats, both, it can be found in dogs and cats, it usually cause no problem. Not in human, not in dogs and cats. Again, they learn these parasites, learn to live with their host uh, peacefully without hurting them. Dog tapeworm, common name for this tapeworm is dog tapeworm. Uh, children can get it. We adults usually do not get it, but children, since their immune system is a little bit weaker, they can get it. Flea is usually is intermediate host. So what happens? Children ingest the flea, and then uh, it becomes adult in children. Uh, the best remedy is to put mouthball in vacuum bags of the vacuums. That way, you break the cycle between the dog, flea, and human. Here, there's uh, as I said, dogs and uh, parasites. Uh, what happens? Uh, the parents brings little. Uh, fecal samples of the children say we don't eat rice, but these little rice grains are found in our children's uh, poop. Why is that? Well, they have uh, they have uh, the palladium canine. Okay, so and same as dogs and cats, this barrel shape look like a barrel. Uh, Proglottids are found in the feces, and in the feces there are many, many, many eggs. A pack of eggs are found in the uh, feces. Uh, in the, uh, the food products. Here they are, the parts we have in the lab, the testes. Of course, you can see that. Do not worry about glass deference, serious pouch, do not worry about that. Uh, just genital pore. I'm concerned with genital pore. And then ovaries, yes, you can see that. And the rest are testes. All of these are testes. And vitellarium, yolk glands, yeah, depends. But it's unique. It looked like a barrel. Okay, look like the rice grain. Here are a pack of eggs inside of, these are all eggs inside of these. Uh, oh, I had a student, he brought uh, a sample of these little rice grains from his dogs. What I did in the lab, I put it on the slide, I, took, I put a drop of water, as you all know how to make it wet mouth, and then I put a cover slip on top and crushed it, and I took that picture. By one, you all learn how to make a wet mouth, right? On a microscopic slide. The next organ is a monesia. Again, uh, it found in ruminant animals like cattle, uh, sheep. They do not harm their host. Another tapeworm that does not harm the host. But very unique in animal kingdom to have an egg which is triangular. Okay, very unique. In animal kingdom, most eggs are round. Or oval shape. Uh, triangular shape, very rare. So that's why I thought monesia uh, eggs in farm animals, most usually in animals as well. Here is pretty much uh, you make sure you know the locations, uh, where they are found, everything else. I, the last few slides I'm talking about it. Uh, the term, uh, th this is not. This is Tinea saginata. The old name was Trichenchus. Um, do not worry about that. It, it's back to Tinea again. It's back to Tinea again. 
so based on that slide, I cross it off uh, generating this. It's not the that name, it changed that. Make sure, just like Protista, you studied uh, location, pathology, mode of transmission. I don't care, you say sporosis become a radio, radio become cercaria, cercaria become metacercaria. That's not significant for me. You should know which one have cercaria, which one have become, we human become by cercaria, which one metacercaria in what? In fish, in grass, cercaria by penetration into the skin. These, these are the things that I like. You know, what kinds of pathology they cause? Uh, cerebral cystic sarcosis, uh, hepatomegaly, enlargement of liver. All right, that's the end of the material for this exam. And then uh, I will have another session for you with you guys for the uh, slides and models. I think that's it. All right.